for giving us space to gather together and to be able to have a discussion. Today, you know, in the last several weeks, we've been looking at devotion to oneness in the body of Christ and to Christian fellowship. And so we're going to have a panel discussion today. Uh, and I'm going to welcome our panel members in. We have uh, Brother Monde from the U.S. Welcome, sir. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. God bless yeah. you, too. Yes. And our other panelist will be Brother Joshua coming from Canada. We welcome you, brother. In the name of Jesus. Now, we're just going to be engaging in a conversation, trusting that the Holy Spirit will guide us, trusting that uh, the things that we've been hearing uh, in these last Saturdays uh, will, will be driven deeper down into our, into our core. Because we're talking about something so very critical, or the Lord is talking to us about something. Oneness in the body of Christ and Christian fellowship. And, you know, the thing that I remember our brother emphasizing, that you can never speak about Christian fellowship or oneness in the body, except that Christ be in a person. Every conversation um, with someone who doesn't have Christ, it has nothing to do with oneness in the body or Christian fellowship. Uh, it has everything to do with will the gospel come forth and be presented to such a person in a way that they can join the fellowship, that they can be a part of it by receiving Christ's life. From us today, we're speaking from the vantage point of the body of Christ. In other words, those who are born again, those who have come to the cross, had their old man terminated, cut away, and had Christ come and dwell in them. And those are the ones who are the body of Christ. Those are the one in whom the spirit of Christ dwells. Like Romans 8 said that if the spirit of Christ is not in us, we are not of him. So we're speaking from that vantage point. Oneness in the body of Christ is not, not um just oneness in a general church assembly, because in a general church assembly, not everyone there has the life of Christ. Or in a discipleship meeting that's large, not everyone there has the life of Christ. And while these meetings are wonderful and these gatherings are wonderful, we're going to be discussing how will we be devoted? I really like that word devoted. To oneness in the body and to Christian fellowship. Devoted has an implication to it that is more than just, I'll give it a shot. I'll take a swing at it. I'll try. No, devoted is, is you know, a, a when somebody has a newborn baby, they have devoted themselves to the care of that child. They have already made an inner commitment that they will raise that child, they will feed that child, they will protect that child, they will love that child. They will clothe that child. They're actually 
wholly devoted to that matter. And I'm hoping that the Lord will help us. I'm believing he'll help us. That even whatever devotion each of us carries into this meeting. Do you know, Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And the reality for every one of us right now is we are what we are right now in this moment. And let's believe God together that whatever devotion each of us has to oneness in the body and to Christian fellowship, whatever we've carried into this meeting, he will give each of us individually an increase as we exit the meeting. So our first, I'm going to pass it to Brother Monday to help us to, and ask him to help remind us um, of what it means to be devoted to oneness in the body of Christ. Sir, I pass it to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brother Scott. Let me just start from uh, the wonderful word that you have just used, that the uh, we can only be devoted to the oneness of the body of Christ amongst those in whom Christ has been born. <clears throat> among those who have been born of Christ, who are born again. So if a man is not born again, he cannot participate in this oneness of the body. And uh, we, are, we have been encouraged now that we should maintain uh, the oneness of this body because the body of Christ is just one. It's one body. It's not two. We don't have two Christ or three or four. It's only one Only one Christ. And Christ, being who he is, he has a body. And the body, like you rightly said, is not localized in one particular spot. The body of Christ is are the members who have believed in him, in whom he has worked on them by bringing them to the cross. And the old man, the enemy of Christ, who has been who has been the ruler of humanity now has been dead on the cross. And so everybody who will be a member of this one body must have experienced what happened on the cross. This life, the life he was born with, must have been seen to have been dead with on the cross of Calvary. And then on that very cross, another life began. So the cross is the end of one life and the same cross is the beginning of another life. So the oneness of the body in Christ are those who have come to the experience of having Christ in their life who has terminated the old life and has become another new life. So the Bible says, if anybody be in Christ, behold, he is a new creation. The old has passed and the new has begun. So when we now talk about being devoted to that oneness, is to being devoted, being committed, being sold out to. So that word devotion is a is not a word that uh, we can take very carelessly because uh, that is where the, the close of the matter is. So we are sold to this spirit. We are committed to it. We are we are we are we are we are we, are, we, we, we give all we have. To now to, to be bounded onto this 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 spirit, and now because uh, as you see in uh, Ephesians chapter in Ephesians chapter th four, the Bible now says from verse four. Ephesians chapter four from verse four says there is one body and one spirit, just as we are called to one hope of your when we are called one Lord, one faith one baptism, one God and the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So we are we are being saved by Christ that we may become members of his body. And because he's, he is one and he has a spirit, we have been baptized into his spirit. We have been brought into, delivered from the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And since light and darkness cannot cohabit together, one cannot be a member of the two kingdoms at the same time. So only those now who have experienced being delivered from the dominion of darkness and have been brought into the kingdom of the Son of God, now they cannot be bonded there and grow in that fellowship. 
So the, the body of Christ is not a, it's not just the church building. The body of Christ are the individuals who have been called out from the world system, who have embraced the life of Christ and have yielded themselves to him in the continuous communion in growing in his own nature and being baptized into his that nature on the continuum. So as many as I have gotten that, then all of them put together now are seen to be the body of Christ. And like you rightly said, no, no individual denomination on the earth is the body of Christ. No church denomination on the earth is the body of Christ. Every church denomination, at best, they are a part of the body. They are a part of the body of Christ. They are not the body of Christ. So every member, then in the local assembly, like you said, the Bible says the foundation of God stands sure. God knows those who are his own. So in every local assembly, God knows those who are who belong to him because uh, those ones, he can identify them as he looks at They say, this one is my own because I can see my son, Jesus Christ, now reigning and living in him. So somebody may be in the church, but because he doesn't have the life of Christ, he is not a member of the church, but he may be in the church. So, but now, so we are now called to be devoted, to be zealous, to maintain the oneness of the spirit of Christ now in those who have believed and have accepted him as their Lord and their Savior. So God is calling us that we should be, we should endeavor, you know, to pursue peace, you know, to, 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 to make sure that the body will grow. So it will be grow to reveal the nature of Christ, who, whom God has appointed to be the Lord of, of the earth. So members of this body uh, are those who are giving their life to Christ, who are daily growing in his nature. He now says, Christ in me is the hope I have to know God. So nobody knows God except the Son. And nobody knows the Son except the Father. So in that fellowship, the Son reveals the Father to, to, to them, and the Father reveals the Son. So there is a growing in knowing who the Father is, and again, in knowing who the Son is. So John now says, this fellowship that we have, our fellowship is with the Father and then with the Son. So we're having the fellowship with the Father and then the Son. And then amongst us, so we are inviting you to that fellowship. So those who have fellowship now with the Father and with the Son are the members of that fellowship. And now they are the ones that have become members of the body of Christ. And so because the body is one, somehow there is only one body, but then there are many, many members. The members are many. The members all drink of the same spirit and they eat from the same bread of life. But in function, their functionality is different. They don't function as the same. So God has given us uh, the analogy of the human body so that we can understand what this is. So the human body is one body, but it has many members. Many members on the body, the hand, the eyes, the legs, the stomach, the kidney, there are many members. And then each of these members all have different functions. What they do in the body is different from each other. But then they drink of the same spirit. They, they, you know, when the mouth is for the body, every member partakes from that meal. But when they want to function, they function differently. All of them are working together for the wholesomeness of the one body. And so one body, but many members. One body, many parts. So each part now is, 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 a, is, a, is a part of one another. So we relate with each other now as members of one another in the body of Christ. So no individual member, no individual member is say, I am more a member of the body than you. The hand cannot say, I am more a member of the body than the leg. No, you are not more than, more than that. You cannot say, I am more a member than the, than the eye. No. Even though the eye is small, he's equally an equal member in the body than like, like any other member. So every member is uniquely different, but they all drink of the same spirit. They have been baptized into the same faith, the same Lord, and the same God. And the God now wants that we should maintain that unity of the faith. So only those who are in Christ can have that. And again, to say this body, the membership transcends race, it transcends occupations. It transcends gender. You could be a male, you could be a female, you could be old, you could be young, you could be black, you could be white, you could be a European or African or Asian or you, 
or maybe from uh, from age, wherever. And as long as you're a human being and Christ is the life you have, you are a bona fide member. And sir, in this body, God, who is the God of all, he does not have a grandchild. God is not the grandfather. God is not a grandfather. So everybody is equally his child at equal level. So we don't have a grandchild of God. For God is, is the father of all. And so even if you are very old or you are young, he's equally your father, the same level as he's the father of any other. So when we present our father. So that is the point that uh, God is saying we should maintain the unity of the body of Christ now in the bond of peace, the peace that God has secured for us in Christ Jesus. That's the point that he wants us to, to labor to maintain even as we grow in grace. God bless you, sir. Our brother has made much input. It's so helpful. Um, so helpful because we're considering what does it mean to be devoted to oneness in the body of Christ. And he's helped us to see that, you know, you we can't be one with a different kind. You know, the Bible will say, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? It'll say, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? That's important to realize that we can't be one. You know, a dog and a lion, they can't be one. They're two different kinds. And they can't reproduce the same thing. So being devoted to oneness in the body, as our brother was saying, is first and foremost only if we have the same life inside of us. And, uh, and then beyond that, I think part of what I was hearing from our brother too was, do you know we're all each individual members of the same body? And the scripture that's coming to me as an example of what he was sharing that we can just briefly look at, and then I'm going to go over to Brother Joshua, is in Acts chapter 6. And just from verse 1, I'm just going to read a couple of verses. He says, now in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. So first of all, the number of disciples was multiplying because in previous chapters you saw that they were endeavoring to keep the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. They were devoted to oneness in the body of Christ. We saw that in the previous chapters. They had all things in common. And they're multiplying. Because when we devote ourselves to oneness in the body of Christ, the Lord himself will multiply what is correct. And it said, uh, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution, then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. This is one of the results of when we will devote ourselves to oneness in the body of Christ. Do you know, these brothers, they knew that as members of the body, that they were assigned something to do. They said it's, we can devote ourselves uh, to the word of God and to prayer. So when they were saying it's not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables, they weren't demeaning the work of serving tables. They were only saying, we have an assignment. 
And it won't even be right for us to trespass into another man's assignment because we are devoted to oneness in the body. So let's come together, brother, and pray. Let's ask the Lord who he wants to carry this out. And you know what I see? I see devotion to oneness in the body coming out of these men. I see them being deliberate, not arrogant, not proud that their particular assignment was what it was, but deliberate that they were to carry out their role and to allow God to choose who was to carry out that role at that given time. And what caught my eye is, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. It was agreeable. And if, if we will endeavor and dedicate and devote ourselves to oneness in the body of Christ, one of those factors is discovering what it is our space that we belong in and that we're to grow in. And also being really readily able to release in the midst of the brethren, trying to control all things. And say there must be someone who God has assigned to carry out this duty. And we even see the prerequisite. They had to be full of the Holy Spirit. So he wasn't, he wasn't saying, let's look for somebody outside of our ranks. But brethren, pray about this. And it's catching my eye that, that first of all, when we are devoted to oneness in the body of Christ, we will see Mo, uh, mo, disciples being multiplied. Second of all, we'll see that we ourselves will be content in discovering from the Lord Jesus and walking in the path that he's ordained for our life. And third of all, that we will discover that this kind of living and operation pleases the whole multitude. It's agreeable. I think these are important because if I'm operating independently and I'm trying to do something that Jesus has assigned to Brother Monday, I'm causing division. If I'm and, and Brother Monday, he's finding great success. The Lord is with him, and grace is abounding, and people are input is being made into the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is being edified. And I call Brother Joshua, and I say, Joshua, man, I, I'm, I'm tired of Brother Monday doing this, man. He, he's always the one everyone gets to see and hear. What am I doing? I'm not devoted to oneness in the body. My very actions are showing, it doesn't matter what I say. Behind the scenes, I'm cutting down Brother Monday. Instead of rejoicing that that assignment that the Lord has given him is prospering and being profitable. This is very critical. And Brother Joshua, I'm going to send it to you for any input that you might have concerning this. But do you, I, I just sense that the Holy Spirit is wanting us to emphasize this because if we won't endeavor to be devoted to this oneness, there will be no way even for this kind of pleasure in the body of Christ. The whole multitude was pleased. How many times have you been in a setting where everybody there was pleased because of the outcome? It's pretty rare. Because usually envy is dwelling in the heart of someone, or jealousy, or bitterness, or why am I not up there? 
Or why aren't I the one being chosen to pray? Or why aren't I? Or why aren't I? Rather than realizing that each of us have something to contribute into this work by the grace of God. Okay, Brother Joshua, let me send it to you. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Brother Scott, and uh, good day to everybody. Um, I believe that, you know, a lot of these challenges that we are are facing as as the body of Christ is, um, it's because the, the word of God is scarce. The truth of the word of God is scarce. Um, and when we, you know, try to uh, modify the gospel or modernize it to accommodate uh, uh, the flesh, uh, then we start to see the demise of uh, or the discounting of who Jesus really is. Uh, and this causes a, a great, you know, uh, challenge that we all now are, you know, here discussing and trying and going to our, our local churches and seeing all the, the various, you know, uh, issues that may uh, be arising. You said earlier, Brother Scott, that not everybody that attends church, you know, has this nature of Christ. Uh, not everybody that isn't part of a, a large uh, discipleship meeting like this, maybe, you know, that uh, that common denominator of the Christ life is not uh, there. So, you know, our devotion to oneness, uh, it's it, it starts also with us understanding what that is. Because if you don't understand what uh, devotion is, and if you don't understand what uh, the body of Christ actually is, as our brother was sharing, Brother Monday was sharing, that every denomination is just part of the body. But if we, if, if we collapse all the denominations and we all come together like that, that because there's only one body, then people will also begin to have an understanding of what uh, the body actually is, right? Uh, it's not one better than the other. It's not one uh, competing with another, uh, but it is just all of us uh, going along in the same direction, following the Lord in the same way, no matter where we're located, no matter our our, our our economic status or our our academic status those things don't matter what matters is if we have christ and if we have christ he will be the one also to lead us in the in the way that we should go uh and as we are following him we will see the uh, you know the oneness of the body restored just as it was in the beginning uh in the book of acts uh, when the when the Lord came in that upper room, they were all in one accord. And that's when the Lord came in and began to not only affect them, but affect all those around, right? You read from Acts chapter 6, uh, and they, uh, the disciples of old, they committed themselves to this, to this unity, to this oneness of the body of Christ, you know, and Though there was a need, <clears throat> sometimes, you know, like I said earlier, there, there's a scarcity of the Word of God. You know, if we read that scripture in Acts 6 very carefully, a lot of our processes, a lot of our ministries in the church would change. Because, you know, they were dealing with a matter that, that related to uh, uh, the Greeks and the Jews, but they were believers, there was an issue among believers, and then they started to distribute the food to them. But a lot of our, 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 our local churches, we believe in distributing food to maybe those that are not even of this fold. So we're actually giving away God's resources to those that are not 
even part of it. Not to say that we shouldn't, you know, help them if, you know, if there's a need, but, you know, we must look to take care of the household of faith first, you know, uh, because those are the ones. So we're giving out food and clothing and different things to others, uh, you know, that they take it and then they just go. Um, but those that are of Christ, maybe there's a need there. Uh, but because the flesh is still in charge of many people's lives, we we put up a front like we don't need, we don't have a need, we don't, we, we cannot suffer. We have to put on our, you know, quote unquote, Sunday best so that we can pretend or show that, oh, God is blessing us. But how can the body of Christ be one? If we don't share our sorrows, if we don't share our needs, but we're only sharing our quote unquote joys, our our bests only with each other, uh, we must trust the Lord to have a have a total, a full, uh, a full rounded uh, view of this oneness of the body of Christ. That though in joy, though in sorrow, though in materials, though in in the word, though in breaking of bread, whatever it is that we would all share together as one uh, in the body of Christ. Thank you. Yes, that, that's. thank you for that input, brother. Brother Monday, do you want to make any additional input or are we ready to move on? I saw, I saw you just looked like you might want to. <laughs> No, and I was just I was just uh, grateful the, the way the way uh, uh, Brad Josh was uh, talking about the issue of sharing, uh, and I hope that we heard what he has said very clearly. You no, know, we ought to share uh, share our not only our 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 joy, we ought to share everything that has to do with the body as a whole. We share our joys as we are taught on uh, Saturday. We share we share our sorrows. Our, our mishap. So whatever happens to one member of the body, it affects the rest members of the body. So everybody ought to be consigned to when the other member now has something to do with. So, you know, like we, we saw in that as chapter 6, the concern there was that uh, some, we are, we are not getting enough of the meal for the day. And it became a concern in the heart of the other brethren. So they now say, no, this is not, uh, it's not very correct. So that was somehow a way of trying to, 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 to defend the oneness. Let there be no, it's such that somebody will be within the body and is crying that, yeah, I don't have anything to eat. No, that should not be so. So uh, we now see that uh, once you're a member of the body, uh, you ought to maybe partake in everything that the body has. You know, the, the joy in the body is that uh, he said, he made a statement, sometimes we do not know our lack of understanding about the oneness in the house makes us not to suffer unnecessarily. You see, the senior brother of the prodigal son was in the house. But then he didn't get to get what was his own because he didn't know that he had to ask the dad. He had to ask the dad. And he didn't even ask the dad. He was annoyed against the dad. I think the dad was a, a hard man. And the, hard, the dad was not the hard man. Just, just ask. So the Bible says, you do not have because you have not asked. You have not asked. But now, even when you ask, you don't have because you are asking at me. So in this body of Christ, in this body now, people are asking God much more, not for their own personal use, but for the members of the body. So when God sees that you are growing well, and you are coming to him, and you are coming like the, 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 that friend that had a friend in the midnight. You are laboring for another member. You are not asking for your, so you are asking for another member. So because you are asking for another member, God sees you that you are behaving, you are growing well. So he, he will even give you much more than you need because you know that if he has given you so much, you are not going to eat, eat all. You are, you are going to be giving to other members of the body. So we now live for the other. So the, the one brother now collects for the other brother. So God now wants that. Uh, you know, one thing now that I want us to know that in the days of old, the brethren brought all that they had together and laid them at the apostles' feet. And the distribution was made 
for to everybody that had a need. So now the church has grown, has become a very big tree. We may not all be at the same place now to be gathering things at the same place, but each member should know that when, when God blesses you, the blessings you have is not only for you alone. You are both the receiver and then the storekeeper. So you are keeping the things of God now as a, as a trustworthy steward of God's grace so that whatever God gives to you, part of it is your own to use to maintain, maintain your body. The other part is for the other members of the body. So you are holding it in stock for the rest of the brethren. So the those that need it, when they need it, and you hear the crowd, oh, there's a need here. They say, okay, what they need here, God has already given supply here. So when God gives it to you, it is meant that I have sent you now to give to the rest of the brethren. It's just like maybe in the company, you have the, maybe the, 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 the pay clerk. When they, at the end of the pay, pay something, the company just gives the check to the pay clerk. So then yeah, they are paid every employee of the company. So the clerk gets the money. Then he now distributes that so that the, the accounts of the individual members or the, or the employees of the company. So one person gets the, the, the check, but he's getting it for every other member employee now of the company. So each one of us, we collect grace from God, then to distribute it now to all the members. So grace for grace. So we collect from the Lord now and then we give it to, to the other members. So that is how to maintain and to nourish and to grow the body now in the oneness of the peace and the joy of God. God bless you, Brother uh, uh, Joshua. Thank you so much. Yes, that's wonderful because we're talking about uh, being devoted to oneness of, of the, in the body. You just said something that struck me that has to come out when we come into prayer time later on to defend the oneness. And I wonder how much each of us are willing to defend the oneness. You know, when you think of defending something, if a soldier is defending a territory, they're laying down their life. They are possibly going to lose their life on that line of defense. If you're defending your marriage, it's you laying down your life. If you're committed to your marriage growing in oneness, it won't be because you're a good teacher. Because you know that your wife doesn't need you to teach her in that moment. She needs to see Christ in that moment, which means you yourself will have to uh, deny yourself. That's defending your marriage. You know, even think of in soccer, there are defenders who are defending the goal, and they're not the ones getting the glory of scoring the goals. but they're critical for the team. Yes, it's wonderful to have the ones who are up front scoring the goals. Okay, wonderful. But they're of no use whatsoever if there's not men or women in place defending. And I just am desiring the Lord would impart to us that kind of desire that I am going to defend oneness in the body at the cost of my own life, maybe at the cost of my own perceived success in ministry. Whatever the cost, I'm, I'm going to ask God later, and I hope you'll, we'll pray together, but, but I'm going to say, Lord, make me to understand this and to be devoted to defending the oneness in the body. Not by word only, but by action in my life. Now we're going to move on. We're still looking at this uh, oneness in the body and devotion to it. Brother Joshua, I'm going to send it to you and ask, what's a practical way? A practical way we can prove our devotion to unity of the body on a regular basis. This will come around to all three of us, but you, you'll be the one who starts us. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, that's it's interesting how you've worded that question in 
proving, um, you know, practically proving um, our devotion to the oneness of the body of the of of Christ, and you know, to prove something means to uh, to demonstrate the truth or existence of something. So when you prove something, it's something that must be lived out. You know, there was this, there was an old hymn that we, we sing in the church you know, uh, all the time. It's Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. And, it, and this, the lyrics continue to say how I prove him over and over. You know, for the longest time, I couldn't sing that line. I would sing the first line. I would sing, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, because I trusted him, and I continue to trust him. But I couldn't sing that second line, because I was, I was, I, it would, that song would prompt me to reflect in my, on my own life and, and say, oh, have I, have I proved him in my, in my daily living? Have I proved Christ? And then if I have proved him, have I proved him over and over? And it, it 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 actually prompted me to to pray more for myself, that Lord help me to live this out every day of my life, that I would I would unashamed uh, Elish, unashamedly sing that song without hesitation, and the Lord has helped me, the Lord has granted me grace even to do this to live out this life, uh, you know, uh, proving Him over and over again. You know, and one of the challenges that we face, you know, as, uh, you know, as believers, as those that are following Jesus, is when we become uh, born again, when we are born again into this new life, a lot of times uh, we call it carryovers. You know, there are settings of the old man that carry over into our walk with the Lord, you know, as babes in Christ, as we start to walk with Jesus. And those carryovers, there are some settings that are still there that we need the Lord to help us, that He would change us. He would take away those things that are, are, are the dross of our lives so that we can become more pure, and the Lord will, I believe the Lord will help us because he's helped so many of those that have gone before us, you know. And our devotion, you know, we, if, if our devotion uh, our, or, or our, our mindset or, our, or maybe I should say our heart set uh, must be changed so that we can then prove our devotion to the unity of the body of Christ, you know. Um, but... We need the Lord to to really open our eyes uh, to see this because, you know, for example, in Toronto here, um, we have a hockey team in Toronto, and the last time they won the championship was 1967. Okay, so that was way before that before I was born. So when I when I was since I've been born, they have never they have never been quote unquote successful in the in the realm of you know of sports. And so for me, when I think about them, it's just like, okay, whatever, you know, you don't really pay much attention to them because they're just they're just off to the side because they're not really a a a a top tier team. So you just think of them as you know mediocre whatever they're not they're not serious you know and 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 the same thing could be said for the body of Christ you know the church has been divided for many many years and and maybe uh because of that we don't know what what oneness is and so the church has been just put put off to the side because we don't understand we don't know you know, we, we 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 say things like, "Oh, my church," or "my pastor," or 
or my blessings. It, 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 the, the focus even of our walk with the Lord has been is, is personally focused. It's all about me. It's all about my. It's all about I, which is the settings of the flesh. So if we haven't seen it, it might be hard for us to prove it. And when you prove something, it's because you've experienced it, you've encountered, you've you've had, uh, you know, you've had a uh, uh, an experience with that thing, so you can prove it. You know. So the Lord has to change our, 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 our maybe our 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 life, our settings, our our even our the way that we speak from my instead of my to we. It's about us. We are just a part of the body of Christ. And there is one body, as we said earlier. You know, in Ecclesiastes 4, uh, verse 9, it says, Two is better than one, because they will have a good reward for their labor. I know we use it a lot in marriage and stuff, but in, as us, as brothers and sisters in Christ, Two is better than one because we will have a reward for our labor. You know, and when we when we come to uh when we come to Jesus, we must ask him to search our hearts that if there are these settings that is only a me focus, even in church. Even in you know in in your in your life totally, if there are things that are just all about me, what can I get? You know, it's the Bible says though you must think of others more highly than ourselves. Look what Jesus did on the cross. He gave up his own life for all of us. He's the firstborn of what of many brethren. He doesn't want to be. Uh, he is not trying to say, "Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm this or I'm that." He wants us to be one, just as he and the Father is one. So Jesus has done all this on the cross. He has sacrificed Himself for us. And who is Jesus? He's the Savior of the world, but He's He's the Reconciler of all things to Himself. So though we maybe have never seen the church as one, we have thousands and thousands of denominations, but with Christ, it is possible for us to become one because he has reconciled everything to himself that we would be one body uh, with him. Thank you. Thank you, brother. So... What I'm gathering out of that practically for application for all of us is we can deliberately be retraining our minds to change our focus from myself to we. And that's a practical application. That's very, uh, that's very helpful because that takes time because we're so used to I. We're so used to, how does this incoming email affect me? How does this change of plans for this meeting affect me? That's our first instinct, generally. And it takes a deliberate, devoted effort to look at how it might affect we instead of putting ourselves at the center of every experience we have. I really appreciate that. Brother Monday, what about you? A practical way which we can prove our devotion. Yeah, I think uh, you know, there's a word they have just used that I, I want us to, to see lay hold upon that. The I and the we. I and the we. If a man actually wants to see if he's maybe practically living out the, the this life is to watch what comes out of his mouth. For the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, and the heart, the first word we heard from God 
he says, after actually, when, when he wanted to, to make my say, let us. God didn't say, let I. He says, let us make man. So it is a it's a composite, it's a composite statement that no that means that uh, God is a is, is is a team, is a team God. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even though they are is one one God, but then they are in three personalities. So they always work as a team, as a body, members of the body. So the scriptures will now declare that uh, the Lord say, Sanctify them by thy word, for thy word is truth. Jesus was praying to the Father to sanctify the disciples by his word, and he himself is the word of God. And so Hebrews says, He who sanctifies us. And we also who are being sanctified, we are all of one. So practically, this body now we will not live to watch what our motives are each time we make a statement or each time we do anything. So once you say I, 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 and I again, the first I we saw in the Bible was when the when sin had entered and God was coming, and then Adam say, you know, Adam didn't say we. He said, I heard your voice. I was afraid. And I, you know, so so I is always the result of the entrance of Mr. Sin into the body. You know, so uh, Joshua just talked about the issue of knowledge. So correct understanding of scriptures will make us now to practically experience the purity and the wholesomeness now of the of, of the body of Christ. You know, the the church you say God created Adam and Eve. Which is not true. God did not create Adam and Eve. God created Adam. Full stop. God created Adam. Full stop. But in this Adam, you have the male Adam and the female Adam. And so Adam, now who was given the right to give a name to all things, he gave the woman and say her name is woman. So the name Eve came after sin had entered the life of Adam. So the Eve was not the original name that was identified with the woman. In the day she was made, she was called woman. That was it. That is our original name that God created for her. So, so our, our oneness, the practicality is to watch our language. So the Bible says, you know, by their, by their words, the way we say things, then our fruition can be determined from that. So practically now, as we grow in that oneness, then it changes, it changes our perception. It changes our values. It changes our relationship. It changes maybe the way we, we, we look at things globally. So we now begin to see things from the angle of the eye of God. We see things as, as God sees them. We know them as God knows them. So when God says, this thing is not good, then we say, it is not good because God said it is not good. Period. It may be good in our own eyes. Say no. Even if it is good in my eye, but God says it is not good. So I'm going to align my eye to the eye the way God sees it. That is not good. So practically now we grow the, the, the body because the body is a, a living organism. It grows. So we also grow from one degree of glory to the other. So we grow as the more we, the more of Him we know, and then the more of Him we become. So we practically now can experience that. That is why God allows certain things to happen to us to enable the body to grow, to enable the body now to 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 to, to be purified, self purification. You know when we look at the, we are talking about the body now. You see one part of the body that nobody wants to identify with. But if you remove it from the body, the entire body will die. That that is the the, end, the the anus. It is the part of the body that is you know that is put there. Now her, her her portion is just to remove the unwanted materials from the body to keep the body whole. And in doing that, it is it is enveloped in in other in micro like microbial something. But he but he does that his work. So, so confidently because that is a portion that God has created for him to, to identify with. So take him away from the body, the entire body will suffer. So now when we are now able to, to build up, we, we nourish each other and we cherish each other. So it becomes, it's a we body, not an I. An I body becomes of the, of the earth, that is of, of the of sin. 
So this brother Christ is building. It's a brother that has a that has the spirit of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit now indwelling and working within the body to make the body wholesome and to make it one, even though it is a it is one one body. But so the Bible says there are differences of administration, but the same God. There are diversities of gifts, but it is the same God that worked all in all. So only one God works diversely. You know, human beings, many of us, you know, like uh, some persons, we, no matter even if they eat five square meals in a day, they are still very slender. But their makeup, they can, they can, they, they, well, no matter whatever they eat, they are slender. Some persons just eat very lightly, but we see them, they are, they are plumpy. It is because of their, their genetic makeup. So now, God wants that because we are in Christ, the genetic makeup of Christ should be the one now ruling and changing us. So uh, practically, it is the fact that uh, as we learn to grow in grace, then the grace of God begins now to show us mercy and then to help us now to, to you know, this uh, the issue of knowing that uh, the setting that like Joshua said, just this morning, sir, just this morning, I was taking a walk before, before this time and I, Something happened to me, and I said, I was going to become uh, offended. I said, yeah. Then I said, But well, you have not asked the Lord. You have not asked the Lord. I said, Why are you becoming offended? Why you have not asked Him? I said, Yes, Lord. I've not asked Him. So why should I be? Well, the moment I, 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 I leave you behind, I'll be in trouble. So so I just said, Lord, I've not asked Him. So what, what is the meaning of this? Only for me to call me, call, call, come home. And then as I was going to take my bath, He brought the meaning to me. I said, Oh, I started shouting, and I was very happy. The, the, the thing I saw that was going to create offense in me, when I looked at it from my own understanding, it was beginning offense. But when I turned to the Lord, it became the theme of joy because he gave me the real meaning of what I had seen. So maybe as we practically begin to learn to trust him, to lean on him, then we cannot be, you know, enjoy the finish. So if, because of I, I, what I heard from him, if I now see another brother who may want to be offended, say, brother, Go ahead and ask him first. Don't be annoyed yet. Ask him. Then you will well, he explains to you, then you'll be you'll be at peace. So practically now that we should be learning to lean on him continuously over every issue that comes to us. So we don't pick offense so easily and then we don't fall away from uh, from the track that is bidding us uh, to follow him. Thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes. And and you know, I mean, basically what well, we've heard so more is so far as just what Jesus said to do. If you desire to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. And that, of course, if if we would practically apply that into every situation of our life, that would be a practical way of proving our devotion to unity in the body. Um, you know, one thing that, that the thing that's for me is as a practical way is, and, and Joshua had spoke about it a little briefly, but what you allow to come out of your mouth. I, I'm not talking about what you think and what you feel. We all have various thoughts. Even Brother Monday just sharing inwardly, he was starting to build a case to take offense. And that's actually normal. He, 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 was, he hadn't entered into sin. He's just feeling away. You know, when we have thoughts that, that pop in, you haven't crossed a line. You've had a thought. And the point is, from that point on, what will you do with it? Will you allow it? to become, uh, you know, like with crowds. Once crowds start to gather together, they get bolder and bolder. The things that one person might say, uh, one person might not say because they don't have the boldness to say it. When they're in a crowd of 100 people, they have boldness to say it. And thoughts are the same way. You know, one thought makes input inside of us. And that's the time to take it captive and carry it to Christ in us. But if we allow those thoughts and other like-minded thoughts to start gathering together, 
they get bolder and bolder. And eventually, something will come out of our mouth. And so a practical way for us to prove our devotion to the unity on a regular basis is being determined not to allow certain things to come out of our mouth, especially concerning fellow brethren. Especially if you have a problem with a fellow brother or sister, you can come and sit in the Lord's presence and talk to him about it. You can engage him, and that's the place where you can be authentic and real with him about how you feel. One of his names is Counselor. But don't let us be in the practice of opening our mouth and speaking ill of our fellow brethren. It will only divide the body. It has zero potential to unite the body. And it has 100% guarantee to bring division. Even if it's just you and one other person you're talking to. What you are doing is spoiling someone else's heart towards that person. And when that person is in your presence, your thoughts are thinking of the things you've been told, whether they're true or not. And so even brethren who love each other, they can be in the same room and there's division in the body. Oneness is impossible because we have opened our mouth to another brother and sown division. So a practical way for application to prove it is to not do it. And when I say not do it, I don't mean pretend like we don't feel the way we feel. That's hypocritical. We carry ourselves to Christ and we talk it through with him. And if he says, now you need to talk to that brother, then we do that and we handle it the right way, and then oneness grows. It's a very important practical application, I think, that we be determined, may the Holy Spirit strike our hearts with conviction when we start to open our mouth to say things, whether they're true or not. Many times we might do it when we don't even know the whole situation. And so I just, when we can be encouraged that one way we can endeavor to practically prove to Christ and also to fellow brethren is we can let our tongue be guarded and yielded to the Holy Spirit. As we continue in this conversation, which is wonderful, we need to enter into a little bit about Christian fellowship. They tie together. Though, that's why we're doing this panel discussion. I mean, we've been discussing it, honestly. But, you know, we need to, we'll just enter into a little area because about 15 minutes till 20 minutes till we're going to spend time praying. So we're not going to cut into our prayer time. So wherever we end up, we end up and we'll enter prayer. Uh, because we need to respond in prayer to the things the Lord is bringing out today. But I'll start with Brother Monde. And maybe you can make some input to us into what is Christian fellowship um, or what the Lord's putting on your heart to, to speak right now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, like we've just been uh, talking now, so the essence of uh, the whole uh, 
issue is God is wanting us now to to be very deliberate in in our devotion to the Christian fellowship uh, and the the devotion there and the fellowship that was Christian fellowship is separated from every other fellowship. So the Christian fellowship is a fellowship of people from diverse cultures and backgrounds, but whose primary focus, like we said earlier, is that they are in Christ. And now they are they are, they are having fellowship both with the Lord who is, who has who is their Lord and their life and with each other. So they are now like we've been taught now. So they are like they are in a ship, you know, on the high sea of this world, and they are moving towards one direction. So they are in, they are not in different ships, they are just only in one ship, and then they are moving towards a common, a common direction and having a, a common focus, and everything about them now is is is, is common. So we let me just read for us maybe a second Corinthians chapter six, and I'll be taking it from verse 14. So that, that fellowship is unique because uh, it sets us a boundary as to who and who ought to be a member there because if it is not the fellowship, then it is not the fellowship. So the fellowship cannot be, cannot be of, uh, of two different kinds. It is only one nature. So in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 14, it says, be not yoked together with unbelievers, which means this fellowship is the fellowship of believers. Believers of what? Believers in Christ. They have believed. They have believed. And the other ones, they also had, but they did not, they have not believed. So the Christian fellowship are those who believe in Christ. Christ is the source of their belief and their faith and their life. So it is those who are who are who are g- giving Christ. Uh, that space in their life to be the Lord over their life, that they now they are having fellowship with Christ and then with each other. You know, the scriptures give us a, a story to say the kingdom of God is like a, a king who was going to a far country to receive the kingdom and to come back and gave talents to his say, occupy till I come. But the moment he left, his citizen says, we don't want this man to rule over us. So there are those who do not want Christ to be the Lord over them. He doesn't, they don't want him to rule over them. Well, so the Christian fellowship are those who have accepted that Jesus should be the Lord over their life. It should be the, the one who is who is the, who is the king who, who directs their steps and who has the final say over any issue that they are involved inside. So he now comes to, to, to direct and then to instruct. So the Christian fellowship are those who are in this fellowship who have yielded themselves now completely and totally now Onto the yoke of the master. So everybody has taken that yoke that they are now being yoked to, to Christ to learn of it. When he says, learn of me. So every member of the fellowship now is learning even the master. So we are all learners. We are, we are fellows in the same class. We are learning the way of life of Christ that will be great now and then they share it together now with, uh, with others. So he says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and darkness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? That means the Christian fellowship are, is a fellowship we are light. Light is the reason and the environment for the common, the common, the common being. Uh, let, let me put up some years ago, in the days when I repented initially. And because I had not yet been guided correctly, I I was very serious, and so the church I repented. And I felt that the pastor, pastor was not doing very well, so I left the church. I left the church with some other people and went to another church. Oh. And we, we, we grew up there, and again that pastor said, "No, you are talking too much about money." We left that church, went to another way, went to another fellowship. Then I was in the other third fellowship, and then one day. The Lord came and met me. I was alone in the room. And so the Lord just met me as if a visitor just came to me. And then he said, uh, I want to ask you a question. I said, he said, light and darkness, who runs for the other? Say, light and darkness, who runs for the other? 
I said, darkness runs for light. See? Correct answer. Then he said, okay, you, are you light or your darkness? Say, are you light or your darkness? Huh? I was transfixed on my seat. I couldn't answer him. I couldn't, I could, am I light or darkness? So, so who, which one am I? I don't know. Who, so he said, okay, see, you have answered very well. Say, light, no, darkness runs away from light. So you repented in this church. You left there, you came here. You left there, you came here. So who is moving? So you are the one moving. So if you are the one moving, so you are the one who is darkness. You are the one who is darkness. So he says, in my house, because I am the light, I do not run for evil. So don't be moving like that from one church to the other. Stay wherever you are and share my light there. So the fellowship are those who have known God as the light of their life. And they are living amongst themselves to be shining the light of God. And that light now, so the light now radiates and shines and covers the darkness. So we, there's one word that Joshua said that I want us to, to hold to. Lack of understanding, ignorance gives the enemy an edge over us. And then mesmerizes us now. I think maybe we are not all, we are not what we all, what we say we are. So as we grow in the Christian fellowship, the light glows, the, and then darkness dis disappears. So darkness can never enter where light is, but light can enter where darkness is. So that is the nature of the light that God wants us to carry. So the Christian fellowship is a fellowship that, like you rightly say, sir, we do not discuss about the other brother behind his back or her back. So it's a fellowship that we don't, we don't, we don't backbite. We don't carry an evil report against a pastor, against an elder, against a lady, against a... No, we don't. If a lady has done something wrong, then being the light, approach her directly. So when you talk to her man to man or person to person, you are not, it's not, it's not an I do, I do, I mean, you're not bad, but because you are addressing her personally, and then if God helps you with her, she may see your light and then repent. But if she, she hears you discussing her behind her to another sister, you now become an accuser of the brethren. And the accuser of the brethren is an agent of Satan. He's the one that accuses the brethren every day. So each person who is in this fellowship must understand who he is in Christ, that he's a builder and not a destroyer. He is in the fellowship to build the body of Christ as a fellowship. So there is this, this essence that uh, we ought to know who we are in Christ, that he comes there now to build. He comes now not to, 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 to establish a, a fellowship where brethren can now be growing in the nature of Christ. So God wants that uh, our fellowship should be a, a, a pointer where the world can see can see God who is invisible. The Lord says, if you have seen me, you have seen my father. Why? Because whatever I say, I am not saying it of my own. It is my father who is in me that doeth the works. And he has said, as my father sent me, so send I you. So go in my name. So the fellowship are those who are relating together in fellowship in the name, by the authority and the power and the grace of Christ who is the author of life. So we now want that uh, God will help us to really understand and enlighten us much more to grow in, to know what this, this fellowship actually is and what the body of Christ actually is that we may now play our role correctly so that we, now become, we don't become a destroyer but a builder of the temple of God so that uh, God now can be, can be, you know, when he says, behold, this is my well beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So the Lord said, God, he said, I have come not to kill. I have come not to destroy. I have come to save. So we in this uh, fellowship are those, those of us who have come to learn him and to leave him and then to win others into the same fellowship so that the name of Christ now can be honored on the face of the earth, that the world may know that there is no other name that God has appointed to save people except in Christ. So if we don't know him, and to live in our fellowship, our life becomes caricature. And then unbelievers say, "No, if this is what it is to be a Christian, then I don't, I don't see, I don't see what's the difference between me and you. We are always, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't go to church, but you who go to church, we don't see any any difference. 
we are we are we are always together with you and you are we share you know, whatever we do you are also there so god wants to be that there has to be a demarcation a separation a purity a cleansing to shine the light of christ now wherever we are now as members of the fellowship who are christians so like we said initially the most important matter is the life of christ but it's not it's not our our, our upbringing or maybe the way we are born or whatever, it is just that Christ in you is the hope that we have now for this fellowship to grow and to blossom. Thank you, sir. Wow, thank you, brother. Um, you know, there's a word that just keeps coming up too as part of our discussion, and that's understanding. And this is such a critical word, and, you know, even if you just read the scriptures, to see what the scriptures say about understanding. You'll hear it say in Proverbs 16, understanding is a wellspring of life. You'll hear in Proverbs 14 says, knowledge is easy to him who has understanding. It's one of the things that the Lord said is the problem that plagues his people, like in Isaiah 5. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And you can't know the truth except that you've been brought into a place where you can progressively develop understanding by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. In fact, in Psalm 119, he said, The entrance of your word gives light. And it gives understanding to the simple. One of the things about that is we're not to remain simple in understanding. We're to remain simple in Christ and to be singularly devoted to him. But do you know one of the things that I've discovered is many people don't understand and know Jesus. They know a little bit about him. They know he died on the cross for their sins. But they don't like it in Galatians 1 when Paul said, When it pleased the Father who separated me from my mother's womb to reveal his Son in me. Not just to me but in me. And when God's people don't understand the work of the cross that separated them from the life they were born with and the purpose of the cross, which was to kill and evacuate that life in order that Christ could come and dwell in us. So I just said it right there, but that doesn't mean you understand it. I said a truth, but it doesn't mean you understand. So what's critical for us, if we're going to be devoted to Christian fellowship, we have to know Jesus. Not just know about him, but we have to be in a long-term, lifelong commitment to cultivating intimacy with Christ in us. And maybe some who are who will hear this don't even fully understand what that means to have Christ in you. That's okay if that's your current understanding, but then your cry needs to be, Lord, I need to see everything that you've done in Christ Jesus. And I need to comprehend beyond just the Bible says so, what that means that Christ is in me. If I'm still reckless with my tongue, if I'm still impulsive and hasty in decision-making, 
if I'm still easily calloused in heart towards fellow brothers and sisters, then one of two things is my reality. One, I don't have Christ in me. Or two, he's in there. The exchange has happened, but I don't know, I don't know him very well. And I don't know how to walk with him with understanding. Christian fellowship hinges completely on each individual member's understanding and knowledge of Jesus. Because if I think, for one, if I think I can do the word, the work of God, then I don't understand. If I think I have power in my own strength to carry out an assignment from God, I'm a babe in understanding. If I try to love the brethren, with my natural ability to love. I don't realize that it's not the kind of love that can endure. But the, that's the kind of love that runs out of energy. So for devotion to Christian fellowship, it is critical for us to understand and know Jesus. In the before I bring this question to Josh, you know, in First Corinthians three, I'll just start at verse one in First Corinthians three. He said, "And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal." This is New King James, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Just grabbing this because one of the understandings critical for true Christian fellowship is to realize that uh, even if the Lord is making great input through me, I'm nothing. I'm not better than someone else. Even if he wants to plant through me, or to water through me, because he's going to give increase to the body of Christ. See, these brothers, they understood he who plants, he's not, he's not anything. It's God who does it. And for genuine Christian fellowship to thrive and to prosper, we can't have we first of all can't have people remaining as babes in Christ. We're not upset that someone's a babe in Christ. If they're newly born, that's what they're supposed to be. Where we get upset is if they've been born again and 20 years later, they're still a babe in Christ. Whining about things that only babes are supposed to whine about, which you accept as a parent because they haven't had space to learn yet and to grow. 
It's not unusual for us to think of a newborn babe in Christ to be carnally minded. They haven't learned anything else. Except for those settings that Brother Joshua was talking about. So we want to be realizing that uh, devotion to fellowship in one instance requires us devoting ourselves entirely as our highest aim. Of course, underneath that aim, everything else will flow. Cultivating understanding and knowing Jesus because he's the one in whom the father made it his good pleasure to put all fullness in. He's the one whom the father does all his work through and nothing is made that's not made through him. He's the one that the Father has said, it is by him. It will be him who upholds all things by the word of his power. And that life has been put in each of us. And if we don't know him, intimately know him. Do you know what Brother Monday shared was one of those ways growing in knowledge of knowing him happens because... I'm starting to get offended, but wait. You see, he's a man who's been developing an intimacy with Jesus Christ in him over a period of time. So rather than being a babe in Christ and letting offense take root and produce what offense does, he's bringing himself to Christ in him and every time we do that we grow every single time every time we realize that even if god did something through me it wasn't me who did it we are being devoted to fellowship with the brother and to oneness in the body Josh, do you want to make some input either on this or the question that I had for you, which was who should a Christian fellowship with or not fellowship with? But whatever the Holy Spirit brings to your mind for right now will be very suitable. All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, the I would say maybe a, a couple things here um, as you were highlighting kind of what the Lord has been sharing with us today, you know, on understanding a scripture came to my, to my heart in Proverbs four, uh, verse seven. So I just wanted to read that before I take care of the question that you've just asked. Um, it says from the new King James version, Proverbs four, verse seven, it says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. So it's great to have wisdom. It's great to have a gift or a talent. But it's great to, you know, have the gifts of the Spirit or, you know, speaking in tongues or whatever the different things the Lord can grant to someone that is walking with Him. But the Bible says, in all that you're getting, get understanding. Because if you don't have understanding, there will be abuse of what you have been given. So the Lord is, is pointing to our hearts today that we must get understanding. Understand who Jesus is. Understand what he did for us on the cross. Understand that it's not just the blood of Jesus that covers our sins, but it was the sinful nature that died on the cross. As Paul says, I was crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ now lives in me. 
and the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God, who gave himself, who died for me and rose again. Um, so I just wanted to add that to all that our brothers have been saying here. And, you know, when you the question you asked about who should we and who should we not fellowship with, um, Christian fellowship, if we just look at that, those two words, Christian and fellowship, the word Christian is Christ-like. So there is a basis, a foundation already for those that are part of this fellowship, those that are part of this group. I don't, I don't want to, I'm not trying to single out, us out, but part of this group, if I may just use that word just for discussion's sake. So there is Christ-like, which is Christian, and there is fellowship. The word fellowship is like an association with, as Brother Monday was sharing be uh, earlier, in the beginning, when God made man and woman, when he made male and female, he called them Adam. There was That was the name that they were given. It wasn't Adam and, you know, I look at I look at uh, Brother Scott in in you know on on his in his uh, you know connection here on Zoom, and it, it it says Scott and Melissa. That's how we that's how that's how we that's how we use it nowadays. So because we need to we have to we have to dif differentiate you know husband and wife, but in the beginning, it was just Adam. It's just Scott. If I say Scott, I'm referring to both of them. Because they are one now in Christ. And they both have the first part of this fellowship, which is Christian, which is Christ-like. Both Scott and Melissa both have that nature. And part of that is as you get to know them, as you get to spend time with them, uh, you know, in various interactions, not necessarily hanging out with people, but as you interact with people, you get to know who they are. That common denominator, that default, uh, you know, um, not, I shouldn't say default, I should say the the basis of their life, the foundation of their life is Christ. So then you know, oh, okay, this is a brother and a sister that 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 I can associate with, that I can that I can talk with, that I can fellowship with. So we have Christian and we have fellowship. So we we now have that understanding of the basis and we also have our, our connection, which is our fellowship. It's all of us connecting together as one, as, as the Lord made Adam in the beginning. And because we have that commonality, or I should maybe say the origin of our new life. Our, the origin of our new life is Christ. The origin of our new life is not the four walls of our church. The, four, the, the origin of our life is not culture. Oh, oh, this is just what we do. Uh, my mom went to church, so I'm going to go to church. Uh, you know, my mom read the Bible, I'm going to read the Bible. No, it's not the basis of our parents' coattails, but it is... It is something that we have in common. It is Christ in us, which is the hope of glory. And Brother Monday mentioned earlier that light and darkness, don't they don't have fellowship together because they don't have anything in common. You know, the saying goes, birds of the same feather, they flock together. So our fellowship with each other must be on the basis of Christ. Or it's not just fellowship, like just, you know, hanging out, laughing and talking and all that. Though that may be part of our fellowship, but it is the basis of Christ. It's on the basis of Christ Jesus, or it is Christian fellowship. You know, uh, but there may be someone out there that might say, well, Jesus ate with tax collectors. Uh, yes, he did. Jesus ate with 
the chief tax collector in Zacchaeus. But if we read the story very well, if we get understanding from what the Bible is talking about, in even in that passage of when he was you know, interacting with Zacchaeus, if we read all through, don't just stop at Jesus going to his house and eating. But if we read throughout, you know what the, what the Bible says? Salvation has come to this house. So the purpose of us even interacting with others that are not necessarily Christians yet is for the sake of sharing the gospel with them, to telling them what Christ has done for them. And then they can also be part of this fellowship that we have going uh, all you know as one body, fellows in the same ship. So this is what the Lord has been sharing with us throughout the various you know Bible studies that we've been having on Saturday. And I trust the Lord will help us to now live this out throughout all uh, you know our daily lives wherever we are located. Thank you. Okay, brethren, we we could keep going for for much time, but we need to mix what we're hearing with faith and in prayer to the Lord. And so, Brother Monday, I'm going to have you start us, and then Brother Joshua will pray, and I'll just go last just to keep us on time. But can we um, pray and and help you? Let's. Can you just start us off, Brother Monday, and guide us in prayer, all of us? Yeah, okay. Brother, wherever we are, can we just uh, bow down our heads as we collectively pray unto the Lord at this hour? Righteous Father in heaven, our Lord and our God, our Savior and our Redeemer, Lord, we want to thank you for this great opportunity that you have offered unto us to gather again before you and within ourselves to learn about this burden that you have, oh God, brought upon our lives. The issue of being devoted to you as the Lord of our lives, being devoted to the body, oh God, and then devoted to the fellowship of the believers who are those that have accepted you as the Lord of their life. And Father, you spoke to us in the beginning that in, in every place, not everybody may be a member of this fellowship. And we don't want to assume that even here, that all of us are members. But that nobody can be a member except you. It is you that originates all things. The Lord said, nobody can come to me except my Father draws him. Lord, look upon us afresh and again. Look upon each one of us. Since you came to save, you came to deliver, you came to, to redeem, we ask to God, should there be any of us here this hour and there's a need for you to, to draw him, Lord, into the fellowship that the, the Lord may give him or her eternal life. We ask to God that you will do this for us in Jesus' name. And again, we trust you that because we are different members, different located in different locations of the same body of Christ, we are praying that you will cause a deep understanding. Lord, unveil yourself deeply into us that we may know each time you speak to us, you grant us light to understand what you are saying, that we may be able to know and then to labor to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For we believe that the Bible says it is God that worketh in us both to will and to do of his own pleasure. Lord, you are the Lord of this fellowship. You are the captain of this ship. And we ask of you, O oh God, that you will look upon us in mercy and help us to grow continuously and that none of us should, will be left behind for you say all that the Father gave to me, no was lost. We are asking, O oh God, that none of us shall be lost, that you are able to save to the uttermost all those who are gathered together into you as you showed them mercy. Lord, in the days of old, when, when Noah found grace, because he found grace, Grace save him and his family. Grace save everybody that has to do with Noah. And you are the author of grace. You are the one who has brought grace unto us. We ask of you that all of us will enter and be saved in you 
for the, your name is a strong tower. You are our fortress and our shield. Want other that will continue to help us to be lost in you and that you also will be lost in us and help us to grow to become profitable members of the body of Christ. And that wherever we are, that your light will so shine in us and through us that the society where we are might see the wonder of grace working in the lives of mortal men to reveal the grace and the mercy of God over the face of the earth. Thank you, our Father, for this discussion this day. We are asking you, God, because you are the rabbi, you are the author of truth, you are the one who is bringing us to shape us, O Father. We ask of you that the word of God will continue to grow in us and that you will create a, a, an environment in us, in our heart, to long, to hunger, to thirst for you continuously. Thank you, our Father, for, for the fellowship within this day. We are that going forward, please deepen it, and cause us, God, to grow in it so that your name will be honored and thy kingdom will be established on the face of the earth. Thank you, our Father. We trust that you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, far more than we can pray. And so, Lord, we ask that you will do this for us to the honor and praise of your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Josh. Father, we continue to, uh, to pray, Lord, that you would help our lives, Lord. Lord, we ask that you would uh, wash us and cleanse us and forgive us, Lord, of Lord anything that we may have said or done, Lord, that have that has caused division in the body of Christ. Lord, we repent of our sins, Lord. Help us, Lord, to uh, to walk in this way, Lord, that you have laid out before us over those uh, the past few weeks, Lord, about this oneness of the body of Christ. Lord, that that prayer that you prayed, Lord, in John 17, Lord, that we would all be one. Lord, I pray that this prayer, Lord, would be answered in our day, O Lord Jesus. Lord, that we would see the body of Christ, Lord, moving and operating as one. For, Lord, there is only one God, one faith, one hope. Lord, one Father, and Lord of all. So, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would help us, Lord. Lord Jesus, that even if we don't currently understand what you are saying to us, Lord, we pray, Lord, that the eyes of our understanding would be opened, Lord. They would be enlightened, Lord, that we would see the truths of your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, that we would not just go back to our old ways, we will not just go back into the habits, Lord, of religion, but, Lord, we would follow you in a relationship, Lord, a lifelong relationship with you, Lord. Lord, and help us, Lord, that we would check ourselves, Lord, continually, Lord. Lord, that we would not go ahead of you. Lord, we would not turn to the left or to the right, but, Lord, we would run everything, Lord, through the filter of Christ. Lord, so that even as we Walk this way, Lord. Lord Jesus, that you would help us. For you said in your word that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to walk, Lord, in this way as you are walking with us, Lord Jesus. That we would see, Lord, in front of us, Lord, every step, Lord, as we, as we follow you, Lord Jesus. And, Lord, we pray, Lord, Lord Jesus, that... Lord, though if there is a lack of understanding, Lord, we pray that, Lord, even uh, as you sent Ananias, Lord, to Paul, to show him the way, to lead him and to guide him, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would raise up, Lord, some Ananiases among us, Lord Jesus. Lord, that would would teach, that would show the the un, uh, and and preach the unadulterated word of God, Lord, so that. Those that hear will understand. Those that hear will know, Lord, that oneness of the body and Christian fellowship, they would know the way of how to live that out. Lord, it will not just be left on the pulpit. It will not just be left, Lord, in, 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 a, in a Bible study. But, Lord, it would be carried in and written on the tablets of our hearts. Lord, so that we can walk in it, 
and that we can live it out, Lord Jesus, so that the world will know us, Lord, for they will know us by our fruit, Lord. They will know us if we love one another, Lord Jesus. So, Father, we pray that you would have mercy upon us, Lord. Lord, and lead us as we follow you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, brethren, let's finish up in praying. Listen, I'm going to be very simple with this as we, that defending the oneness. So before I pray, can you be speaking to the Lord yourself concerning that? Are you willing to defend the oneness of the body of Christ? And if so, can you express that willingness to him with your own mouth? Are you willing to give him permission to bring conviction to your heart immediately when you are 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 moving away from defending the oneness? Are you willing to give our God and Father the Holy Spirit freedom to bring it immediately to your mind with weight? And we ask the Father to have mercy on us concerning this. It's not condemnation. It's conviction and grace to succeed. That's what we're asking for. Father, I'm willing to be convicted by you immediately when I'm starting to cross a line and so division when I'm when I'm leaving my post to defend the oneness. Let me see it. Let me see it in its subtleties. Let me see it in its obviousness. Let me see it and let me quickly, quickly, quickly turn to Christ in me for instruction, for grace, for everything. Can you say to the Lord our God, I will defend the oneness of the body of Christ. I will stand my post. I will not abandon my fellow members. Holy Spirit, Jesus said you would help us, so we ask you to help us to grow in this so that each one of us will stand where we're supposed to stand and be doing what we're supposed to be doing with the grace that Christ supplies us and that our uh, our unity will increase and be strengthened and woven together for the glory of God. Lord, we thank you and just give you praise. As this conversation goes forth, may you help people to hear what you are saying. May you help them to throw the way throw away the chaff and, and gather into themselves that which will be good and useful to their lives. And may you use each one of us as instruments of righteousness to develop unity in the body of Christ and authentic Christian fellowship that will cause, do you know, Lord, when a flash, when two flashlights are brought together, the intensity and brightness of the light and the reach of the light is extended. May you unite us by your light that is the life of Christ in us. And may you be glorified as a result of what you've sown into our hearts today. 
Thank you, Holy Father. We give you all praise. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we have prayed. Amen. Brethren, we praise God and thank you so much for coming. Um, we have some announcements before we share the grace. And hopefully my brethren will help me with the screen. That if you have any counseling needs or inquiries, please uh, reach out. This life is not about pretending like we have it all figured out. And sometimes we need to talk to someone to help us process through and learn this way more accurately. I always say, if you want to take a, a picture of this or get a screenshot, uh, we have brethren who can help you and connect you and you can be connected to in these various locations. Please utilize that. And we're going to continue in this uh, devotions of a disciple. Uh, if you know, as the Holy Spirit leads you, invite others uh, that this truth may penetrate and, and stretch beyond where we currently are. We just are grateful for everyone to be coming. And we may be done. All right. Okay, so we're all going to unmute ourselves and make a holy mess out of sharing the grace and give God praise. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. God bless you.